Bula and welcome to The Lens at 177. On this show, we are speaking to a lady who does not need any introduction. Uh, some might even refer to her as Fiji's Iron Lady. And uh, she's someone who's worked in uh, the domestic violence and child abuse space for a very long time, a very passionate feminist. Um, Shamima Ali, the coordinator of the Fiji Women's Crisis Center. Bula Shamima and welcome to the show. Bula Felix and Bula listeners, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you know, we've been wanting to get you on the show for quite a while. Uh, in the past 16 years, you were quite vocal in your uh, views. You had very uh, strong views about the way things were being conducted by the previous government. Um, and you were looked at as uh, and viewed as the voice of the people in many cases uh, when you raised the issues of uh, national interest. So now we have a new government in place. And uh, you know, it's a bit of a challenge, it's a coalition government. So six months in, uh, you know, I just wanted to get your views on uh, how they're progressing from, from your side of the table. How do you think this government is progressing so far? Well, first of all, I'd just like to say that uh, I've had the habit of uh, being very interested in, uh, in national issues right. from the time, because remember I've seen my, the years I have on me has enabled me to see about three coups from right. 1987 to 2002, uh, four I guess, mm. 2000 to 2006, right. and, uh, and I'm very passionate about human rights and you know, women's rights yes. and everyone's rights and so on. And uh, so, uh, you know, in 87 we were thrown into the political arena and right. we had to stand up. So we have been, in, well I have been involved very much and also, uh, you know, we've held not only the last government accountable, but every government accountable, right. and uh, so on. And we continue to do that. So, the last 16 years, for me, have been the worst politically and in terms of uh, spaces for human rights, uh, you yes. know, democratic principles, rule of law, and so on. Have been the most difficult times for us and uh, and as the 16 years progressed I would say the last decade has been worse than ever before mm. and that's why we all had to stand up and I believe that when I looked around and very few people were standing up so I right. thought I need to do something about it yes. because as I've said before I love this country yes. and uh, you know I was born here I'm fourth generation right. I, and I'm also of mixed parentage you know yes. my uh, Vasu is from Lameviti Right. Uh, and I'm from Nawaka in Nandi, my father is from there. Right. So, you know, so I've had the best of both worlds. Right. And uh, so, you know, so it, it, it should be the, in, the, in the interest of all of us as citizens of this country, right. that we love this country and we do our best for, for, for the country. Right. So for me right now, I'm enjoying the civil liberties that have been denied yes. us for a long time. Uh, and particularly for those who are a lot more vulnerable, who could not speak out, mm -hmm. uh, and people who were uh, victimized uh, when they did speak out or the, if they held uh, particular views about the government, not right. about issues, but the government. So at the moment, I'm enjoying that. Um, and of course, there are huge opportunities. Yes. We have always missed opportunities in this country when That's we had right. coups, yeah, whenever there's been a change of government. <coughs> so I guess that is politics and people mm. behave in that way. But mm. it's for us, the citizens, to hold the governments accountable. Yes. So uh, for me, while, uh, you know, uh, while I, I, I feel the sense of freedom both for myself and for for my, the people that I know, my friends, and just generally going around Fiji and right. so on, uh, while we enjoy that and uh, and so on, um, you know, we have been brought back to reality mm -hmm. uh, because of the times. Yes. Uh, these the times are bad throughout the world, and mm -hmm. Fiji worse than ever before. You know, the wastages, the extravagance with which the last government conducted its business. Right. We're all going through those austere times, right. and so on. Uh, and it, this government has. A a huge opportunity. Right. It's difficult, coalitions are always difficult, but we have a huge opportunity to make things better. Yes. And this government has, and I will support it mm. to do just that. Mm. Uh, while people are talking about the fact that we are very quiet when this government does this and that, right. we are quietly, we, 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 it's very fragile. It's a coalition, and there has been issues around that, right. uh, and we need to keep them together, and they need to keep together. So we need to hold them accountable. We can do it in various ways. Yes. 
I definitely don't want at this point in time any other government to come into power. Right. Uh, we can work towards different politics, different political systems, you know, for the next four years and so on, but, or, you know, different leadership uh, and so on, but right at this point in time, we are doing that. Mm -hmm. I talk to ministers, I text them all the time, I right. try to get meetings with them and so on. The good thing is some of them do seek out uh, my opinion. Right for what it's worth <laughs> and uh, and uh, so you know we're able to talk and yes. tell them we don't like this and we don't like this this shouldn't have happened that shouldn't have happened which didn't or, happen in the previous no we couldn't yeah th in the beginning we could from people that we knew but definitely but uh, as uh, the going got tough right. people did not want to uh, listen right. anymore they stopped listening yeah. so as long as the politicians are listening right. and straightening things like you know a lot of things have happened the tints in most vehicles have gone right. the huge on Entourage has gone. Yes. Uh, the bodyguards have gone in most cases. Though I must say, there are things like uh, uh, I went through some difficulty a few weeks ago. Right. I was coming back from the west, mm -hmm. and so those are little things. But you know, it's also uh, the kind of leadership that Fiji needs right now. And I was coming back and uh, mm -hmm. uh, timed myself well to miss the traffic uh, right. to coming back from Nandi to Suva, and we were held up by an entourage in Duvu. And that hold up continued right till the uh, till Reservoir Road, and there was a long line of traffic. Okay. The president's on to a rush with the police flashing lights, going very slow on the highway yes. uh, below the required uh, uh, mileage uh, uh, speed, and. Uh, and no one was supposed to pass, you know. So, so they didn't allow people to, people uh, to pass, even uh, where you legally you can on the two lanes, you yes. know, the passing lanes yeah. and so on. Mm. And uh, they were going very, very slow. Yeah. There's a huge line of traffic behind us. Right. We were about sixth in line, and uh, the way that they stopped people from coming, you know, it's, it's thuggery, I thought. Right. And I think those things we need to bring up, and uh, I have brought it up with, uh, with, uh, with someone, a minister, and uh, yeah. hoping that those, uh, they, it will take time, but uh, because yes. we're used to 16 years of that of kind that, of uh, pomp and, you know, and, uh, and people, that, that kind of leadership, yeah. you know, which is very, uh, you know, yeah. smacks of di dictatorship. Yeah. So I think those things need to go. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, uh, and uh, you know, um, the other thing is what I like is that the swiftness with which they respond to people. Right, okay. Uh, you know, like uh, we do know the infrastructure is in serious trouble. Mm. It has been neglected for so long. Yes. You know, and so they are, you know, immediately responding. There's a $200 million uh, mm. budget line for that, uh, repairing all of that. The health centers, the markets where people, mm. you know, vulnerable people are suffering in the remote areas and right. so on. Suvana, sorry. So, so those things are good, you know, providing someone immediately with a uh, harvester, you know, the, uh, I oh, wear the, rice, uh, yes, rice. the rice harvester. The and mortuaries so. as well. Eh? Yeah, the mortuaries, the yeah. Levuka mortuary. Yeah. They've been crying out for so long. Mm -hmm. And then they come in and they fix that up because that was so important. Yes. And, you know, so, so I think we need to celebrate those things. Right. But we, you know, and, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, the, the uh, Fukushima issue yes. Is, yes, uh, is, is, is something that they need to look Look out for right. because Fiji is quite vocal on uh, on the issue of the environment of mm. uh, the climate change and so on right. and uh, you know we're talking at all of the Pacific we the Pacific looks up at Fiji as yes. the leader right. so we have to set the example and we have to walk the talk mm. so I think that needs some explanation to the people and right. uh, and uh, uh, thinking again uh, you know and you know the Vulangi issue right. whichever way the Prime Minister meant it but it's it's very very sensitive, you know, so mm. we need to be careful, they need to be careful of all of those things. And I think those things we can work through, yeah. but I think the nuclear waste dumping is a big issue that we need to look at. Yes. Uh, the, you know, the government also has to look at things like uh, its relationship with countries that are oppressing the people of the Pacific, and I'm talking about West Papua. Yeah. We've made a statement that we're supporting West Papua, yes. then we have to go the whole length and, yes. you know, the, take it through and so on, the, looking out for our Pacific neighbors who look up to us. So I think those are things. So there are good things and there are bad things. We're working very well with the Ministry for Women right. and the Minister is great yeah. uh, and so on. So yeah, so I think for me it is a good time yeah. uh, but, uh, but we have to ensure that it continues this way. Okay, um, you know you mentioned the Vulani issue. 
Um, some people would say that uh, a Vulani is treated special. You know, if you're a Vulani, you, if I go from, uh, say, from my village in Yasama mm -hmm. to Kandavu, you know, we have a special relationship. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would be given special treatment. Mm -hmm. So maybe it might have been misconstrued what he had said. Yeah. I, I think I understand where he's coming from, but you see, if you're as old as I am, right. and uh, in 1987, the way that word was used, that right. still jars uh, jars with people. Right. Uh, you know that when people were made to feel people who had been here fourth generation, third generation, and right. have called Fiji home, yes. and they were told that they were Vulangis and they should go back where they came right. from, they've overstayed, right. they're welcome. So, so, you know, so those things jar with people still because race is an issue. Right. And I'm so glad that what the Nars is writing and, you know, you are, uh, Fish Times is printing those right. articles because those are things we know, we right. feel, we talk about behind closed doors. Right. But that is the truth of this place. Yes. Uh, while, you know, Fiji is known for its treatment of Vulangis, you know, that how friendly we yes. are and everything else. Look at our tourism industry, mm -hmm. people love us, though we have high rates of violence against women right. and girls, but uh, so we are known for that. And the politicians have always made use of the race issue. You know, yeah. they, they are, too, I, I believe, the leadership, successive leadership, starting from the colonial masters, you yes. know, that have made race, uh, ra race and the words like Vulangi a dirty word, which, which uh, evokes a whole lot of emotions and right. often not good. Okay. So that is why I think that's why I'm saying that uh, mm -hmm. before we, in, as leaders, we have a huge responsibility yeah. and we should know our people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when we say something, mm -hmm. we have to be aware of all those things. Right. There needs to be deeper right. thinking around yes. it uh, rather than saying it. Because I know that's how we talk. Yeah. Uh, but I think when you hold the position of a prime minister, a minister mm -hmm. and uh, a, a church minister, the archbishop or whoever, you know, yes. so you need to be careful because people listen to you and right. know that you are in power and you, you have the power to make it go the wrong way or the right way. You know? So right. that is why okay. it is uh, sensitive. Thank you. We'll be right back after a short break. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Bula and welcome back to The Lens at 177. Uh, we are having a good conversation with uh, coordinator of the Fiji Women's Crisis Center and human rights activist Shamima Ali. Um, I'm now going to move into you know the work of the crisis center. Uh, uh, while the previous government did not really acknowledge uh, the work that uh, Shamima and her team have done for many many years, um, the current government, I believe, is working with um, FWCC. So could you just share a bit about uh, you know the work that you did? Uh, do, even uh, during the COVID-19 crisis as well. If you could just share a bit with our viewers. Sure. Uh, yes, the crisis center, we have continued our work. Mm -hmm. uh, the previous government had no choice but to work with us because right. we had all the information with them, the prevalence, prevalence study on intimate partner violence, which yeah. each government, you know, successive governments have used for policy and uh, budgeting and things like that. Right. So, and uh, of course, with the, with the, the form former Minister for Women, Mary Saini, yes. uh, Rakwita. Uh, we, we did a lot of work together under her leadership, you know, the NAP, the National Action Plan for Prevention, which this government has launched and put budget, uh, yes. uh, a budget to it and everything else. So yeah, so we are working very closely together and we did a lot of work
work also we while we are working on women's human rights promoting women and girls the children are also there women in all their people in all their diversities mm -hmm. uh, disabilities and so on we've worked that way for a very long time and uh, we're also a regional entity we work in the region and right. recognized in the region um, during COVID of course we had to step up yes. a lot and uh, you know with the a request from uh, the now assistant minister for women um, Sashi Kiran, who was the CEO for Friend, mm. uh, she reached out to some of us feminist groups and said, uh, human rights groups, and said, can we work together, please? Because she was finding it very overwhelming. She was right. taking on uh, uh, the burden of the government, right. what the government should have done at that point in time. So she reached out to us, mm. and uh, we formed the COVID Alliance mm. uh, that was made up of uh, the Fiji Human Rights Movement, Fiji Women's Crisis Center, CCF, uh, SEEP, uh, and also DIVA for a while, then they moved off and we worked in partnership with the Sangam, the Fiji Sangam and so on. Uh, so we were, you know, so there were so many needs at that time and yes. all those needs were neglected. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, the, and particularly in the health sector where mm. it was most needed. And people were dying and people were isolated because they had, uh, they were in isolation because they had contracted. Mm. There were borders and all things and people could not get food. Mm. And then uh, Sashi, uh, uh, Kiran, um, you know, she, she knows her way in everywhere because right. of the concerns that she has, particularly uh, the work that Friend was doing in the health sector and so on. Yeah. So she managed to uh, find out what the needs were, and the needs were great. Yes. Um, and she reached out to us. So we helped out in whatever way we can. At that point in time, uh, there were people, entities, we were, uh, we were given money from overseas. Mm -hmm. Some of our partners, they said, for COVID response. Right. And uh, so we had to use that money. So we had about uh, uh, half a million dollars at that time. Yeah. And we spent most of that, about $450,000 on providing things for the health sector. Uh, you know, so she would find out what was needed. She didn't have the resources, so she'd reach out to us. So the crisis center, we spent about that much. And there were things, and of course, there was no acknowledgement at that time. People did not want to acknowledge, even when we took uh, beds, maternity beds for the first time to Lotoka Hospital, about five of them, each one of them costing about 3,000 each. Right. And how the staff, they nearly cried. The nurses, they said that's the first time in years they had seen a new bed for the maternity ward and things oh, like that. Okay. So they could never, we could not put out pictures because of the fear of because the government did not want it to be known that anyone else was helping right. out you know so they were that yes. that vindictive and taking things very personal so if yeah. you uh, you know they, they could not take criticism and uh, you know that if we did criticize if them then that means we were not Fiji citizens or something we could not help out with right. Fiji that we had no, no role to play so we were able to do a whole lot of things from grocery leasing three minivans to be converted right. so that dead bodies instead of being put in trucks and taken around from here and there could be carried in those giving dignity to the dead those yes. who had died with COVID because the families couldn't go and help them out so we did all of that we helped with kidney dialysis we spent about 20,000 uh, helping out three women uh, one child and two women with uh, surgeries, uh, cancer surgeries and so on. Right. So all the money we had we put into that because that was what people had given us that money for. From uh, uh, from uh, mattresses, from uh, uh, putting uh, out beds in uh, like different halls where COVID patients were supposed to be put 50 beds, 200 beds and all the beddings and everything else. Right. Um, the oxygen cylinders uh, right. and uh, also for interns I paid myself personally uh, for cannulas. They right. didn't even have that, you know, and things like yes. that. So a whole lot of things that we did at that point in time. Yes. Uh, you know, um, uh, the uh, golden age home for the elderly, yes. uh, the water tanks and so on. So, I mean, we've got the whole list there and it all, it cost us in excess of $450,000 and we paid for all of that with no acknowledgement at any point in time. Right. Uh, even uh, the PS now, uh, 
Dr. Fong would not talk to us or return any of my calls, but Sashi was the conduit, and mm. and and uh, and she would push her way in and to find out what was wrong, and we did that. So you know, so we also did all of that work, mm. as well as participating in the pro democracy movement, ensuring that government did what was required of it, right. and of course, as you know, uh, you know, and and the women kept on coming in during COVID. We had a 300% rise in co phone calls and so on. Yes. Domestic violence rose as throughout the world. It did in Fiji also. So we were prepared for that. Mm -hmm worked with the Fiji police and our referral pathways and so on with the Ministry for Women. So we were able to get people to safe places and, and so on. Women, uh, you know, birthing mothers from Yasawa, from your island, uh, because uh, the medical boat did not have permission to bring them because they come and birth at uh, Lotoka Hospital. Yes. So our people were stuck there and they managed to get a boat to come across to Mba. They had to go to Ba, not to Lotoka, because I think Lotoka was uh, isolated. Uh, right. And so on. So, uh, bringing pregnant women and keeping them in our refuge, in our shelters, the mm -hmm. buildings that we have, till they were ready, Lotoka Hospital was ready to take them in. So, you know, all those things that we did, mm -hmm. we provided patients uh, who were isolated, who came in from other places for the Ministry of Health at the at one of the motels that we use, and mm -hmm. so on. So, yeah. So, so doing all of that, and at the same time making sure that you know that everything was going well at the center, our staff were all busy. Oh, yeah, and the other thing that we did was the telehealth line. Yes. So some of our staff from Lambasa, were from the Lambasa Center, were stuck here. They couldn't go back because Lambasa was in isolation. Yes. So they couldn't go back. So they were staying at one of our residences here. And so they ran the telehealth line with training from Sashi and other medical personnel. Mm -hmm. So they were running 17 lines. We had to get 17 laptops and 17 lines. So even that we got involved with. You know? So mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of stuff. And we rise up anytime when there are disasters and so on. Um, at the moment, uh, you know, uh, funding uh, was an issue, but now we are quite good with New Zealand committing for five years and uh, Australia for another two, then maybe another two and so on. So, right. And there are lots of good well wishes around yes. the world. In Fiji also, people mm -hmm. who have passed on yes. and they have left a legacy for us, you know, mm -hmm. sort of a, a, an endowment and things like that. So we're using all of that to do the work in this country because the numbers are increasing. Yes. Uh, more people are reporting right. and uh, more people are seeking housing and so on. Uh, that goes on, you know, and this week we turned 39. Right. So the crisis center has okay. been around for 39 years and uh, and the work goes on. We are in Lambasa, we are in Bar Rakiraki, we just reopened Rakiraki last week, and uh, Nandi, and then Suva, of course, is the headquarters. We're also serving the region. There are more and more requests from around the Pacific right. for us yes. to do this work. Uh, and then, you know, uh, working with men also oh, uh, and so on here. Yeah. So you know so all those things that we do, I'm losing staff. Yes. people are migrating right. young people. Uh, so that is an issue for us. That's a huge challenge. Of course, our police officers are a challenge all the time, right. the police force and I think it's gone worse in the last 16 years right. and has been heavily militarized yes. and uh, and uh, people were very scared to think out of the box as in all other oh, government yeah. departments right. and so on. Uh, we're looking, you know, I'm often in conversation with the minister mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also various commanders and so on, uh, police commanders around. Uh, we have a police liaison officer, retired police yeah. officer, who is uh, uh, following up on cases. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say that the police force not their fault, maybe, but, but then we always have had that because oh, when it comes yeah. to gender and women, we have difficulties with, the, mm -hmm. uh, with people responding as they should be responding, domestic violence, so on. But it's a work in progress. We are yeah. meeting with senior female officers and yeah. keeping the conversations open. Thank you. <laughs> we'll be right back after a short break. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first.
Welcome back to The Lens at 177. We're having a very interesting conversation with uh, Shami Mali, the coordinator of the Fiji Women's Crisis Center, about uh, some interesting issues that we are facing um, in her space, but also issues of national interest. Um, Shamima, one issue you've always spoken out against is rugby players who were convicted of uh, sexual violence or rape and that were in jail that were allowed to play rugby. You know, uh, you've never been silent on that issue. And I think a lot of people uh, on social media have uh, said some things against your, your stand. So, you know, if you could just explain why you're so passionate about that. Well, one is like, uh, you know, we, we have done a lot of work in the last 39 years to get violence against women recognized yes. and on people's conscience. We've come out with policies, new laws and all that. That's the lobbying that we have done together with some of our other families, friends and organizations right. and so on. So we have, and, and we are totally committed to it. We don't believe that any woman, any girl, any child should go through the kind of torture that women go through. You know, right. Rape, domestic violence, sexual harassment, child rape, all those things yeah? and right. everything that's connected to it. And we did realize some time back before it became the fashion mm -hmm. that sports was a good way to go and we were approached by uh, Ms. Seme Malangilangi a long time ago, over a decade ago, mm -hmm. who was uh, working with volleyball. Right. And uh, to and she was one of our advocates, so she you know got us to us to talk how we can use sports right. to end violence against women and girls and how do we because you know everyone watches rugby particularly yes. sports people I mean Fiji is sports mad yes. and particularly the rugby mad you know we're just so into it you know men and women right. so that was a good we felt that sports was a place where we could introduce this and you know create advocates and stop this and and as we went into that the FRU at that time some years back uh, reached out to us mm -hmm. and we started working with them on child protection and so on and we also like because rugby was the one that I was really really in all sports but rugby particularly and also women's participation right. that women wanted to play rugby but the barriers they were there and still exist up yeah. till today I mean we saw it in the sports during the weekend how right. the double standards you know? yes exactly rugby. how the women play where the boys play where the girls play even up to there so that has hasn't gone away, right. and uh, and uh, and we believed also that rugby players can be such great positive role models. Right. You know, like I don't beat my wife. You know, I don't nothing. They should be, and because people look up to them. Right that they should be these role models, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that, uh, you know, no one is accused of rape, no one has been convicted of rape, mm -hmm. we don't have uh, uh, wife beaters there, and right. so on. I have raised the issue over and over again with FRU, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, gladly, uh, thank, uh, thankfully that uh, uh, the convicted uh, rapists who are serving their time are not being, bro being brought out from prison to play in public games, not right. only within there. Uh, and other, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, rugby, co rugby competitions like uh, the Coral Coast, we're working very closely with them. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, that they are, have got a clause there that says that they will not do that, you know. Right. If you've served your time and you've come out and you reform, that's different, but not while serving. So that uh, paying uh, particular attention to that, so we formed a partnership there. But also, uh, recently, I had uh, Mr. Maisie. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked him to come in because uh, uh, we heard that there were two people who were going to be named in the, no, they were already named in the squad for World Rugby, the, oh, the World, World Cup. Cup for the oh. World Cup, yes. And so we raised our issue. Yes. Uh, one, uh, there was a lot of publicity about him having beaten up his wife and ch a child got hurt and he, she ended up in hospital. Right. Um, and another one uh, was convicted mm -hmm. in France yes. uh, for uh, sexual assault. Right. 
right. and assaulting other people when they tried to help the girl. There were two of them, but one wasn't named in the squad. So we raised our issues about that because this is World Cup rugby yeah. and our people will be all watching. And then, you know, if yeah. people have gotten away with that, mm -hmm. then, you know, then we have to protect our women and girls. If people have, then this is what young boys are watching. Oh, see, he did that. We can do that too. You know, it's nothing. Yeah. It's nothing. So we don't want, we want violence against women to be taken seriously. Right. And rugby is the best place to do it, but not on, uh, and we have to show some examples. So the question here is what is more important? Yes. Winning a rugby cup or women's lives, girls' lives? We have very high rates of violence against women mm -hmm. and girls in this country. Children, rape, you see the DPP's data every month yes. and it's shocking. Uh, so, you know, we, everyone has a role to play and sports particularly. So we did talk and uh, the answer came back to us from the coach. Are they going to serve their term forever? And things like that, you right. see. And uh, this is from the head coach. Yes. So right. I mean, I got an email and yeah. uh, and said that are we, they're going to. So you know. So we have left it at that point in time, but it's still an alive issue. It is yes. not dead, and we most probably will write again. Mm -hmm. And particularly with the government, government has got a very strong gender policy. Yes. Equality for all. Yes. It's got a national action plan for prevention right. with millions of dollars, and a lot of donors have come in, particularly mm -hmm. Australia, has come in to make sure that this plan goes forward. Mm -hmm. We have a five-year plan. Uh, and uh, all CSOs and all of government, all of population. So keeping all those things in mind, right. we have to continue in that manner, just like I was talking about the waste dumping in yes. our oceans. If we are leading the Pacific on climate change and dumping waste, our blue Pacific, and uh, you know we are really advocating for a blue Pacific, then everything has to go together in tandem, right. aligned. Only then can we find success. Right. So that is why we are so, so committed to this. And uh, also, you know, with the, we, we have had very various uh, pieces of research done yes. on the treatment of women in rugby because women have a right to be everywhere right. you know it's not some some people are writing oh then why do you want to play men's sports so you know you suffer and things mm -hmm. like that so that's not the point the point is we all must have enjoy all our human rights Women have every right to play rugby, but the conditions are so bad, the discrimination, the barriers, their sexual orientation, that has been an ongoing thing and we have worked through all of this right. over the last decade and yes. so. And, uh, and the research that has been done, uh, that also, uh, you know, people haven't acted on that. Yes. Very good pieces of research that we can enhance and promote women in sports, but also where we can have good good, positive, non-violent role models as players yes. so that our young people are learning, you know, we, yes. yeah, so, so that is the reason we are totally committed to that and you know, this is literally about creating a level play, uh, playing field, literally right. and also figuratively, figuratively. Yes, yes, both of that, you know, so yeah. Um, you know, a, a lot of people wouldn't know that you actually started off in media. Uh, yes. You know, in uh, mainstream media and uh, you have a lot of experience. Um, as someone who started in the in a media organization and you've watched how the media landscape has evolved over the years uh, the past 16 and even till now with the present government just your views on on the media itself <laughs> so, uh, here, here I go, maybe semi, you might have to work harder, I might not be invited by media again. Um, no, uh, so, no I, I just want to correct that I was a science teacher. Right. So I, was, I oh, taught in Ngao teacher, and Suva right. Grammar and so on, but right. then I joined uh, FM 96, right. the first lot of people as a, a producer, presenter, and I also did some sports work and so on. Uh, in 1985, that ages me, so when they wow. first started, so I yeah. started there. And, uh, okay. and you know, the way we were taught, the way uh, we were taught by the likes of Kevin Thomas uh, you know, and William Parkinson and so on, the people who taught us, uh, you know, uh, it was 
get in, get on, and get out. Right. <laughs> so, so we talked less, yeah. and when we talked, it must be gems coming out of our mouth you right. know, when we talked about things and so right. on. And from a place of knowledge, we had to come in early, do our research and things like that. Right. And now when I listen to the radio, you know, uh, people can say anything. I don't see that kind of experience and so on in yeah. many of the announcers that are there, the people who are presenting on radio and so on. But Talking about the media, of course, the media. Uh, you know, uh, I believe I, I I follow the media. I read up on uh, on people, and you know, I also have been good friends with people like David Roby and things. And so I know just how much dedication there has been. Um, John Pilger is one of my heroes, yes. and uh, I always remember what he said about media reporting. And he said. It's not your job to be neutral. Right. Your job is to be, to tell the truth. Right. You tell the truth right. to be neutral. And that's what I find dif difficult to stomach right now, yes. the, the opposite of that right now. Yes. Um, and I think the last 16 years have been the worst ever for the media. Yes. Uh, there were so many restrictions and right. so on. And uh, by the way, we did always promote media freedom, right. the, the women's movement, the NGO coalition for human rights and so on. Um, we did. Uh, and uh, it was very, and, and a lot of senior journalists left, I guess, yes. and the mentoring and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, we left with new people, right. new people who, and the coup happened in 2006, might have been about, what, five years old, six yes. years old and things like that. Mm -hmm. And they're now in their 20s or, you know, early 20s, late 20s and so on. So they don't know what it used to be like before. Yes, that's true. So even and so they only know that. And what I'm seeing is that there are things like now after, uh, you know, the, 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 we do have media freedom now. Yes. And it's, it's been huge uh, celebrations and so on. Uh, but I still find the media is acting like they used to before. Right. Uh, you know, that, that habit hasn't gone away. They need to know this is a free media. Uh, the now we, it is freedom. We have to report things as they are. Yes. And no bias, right. you know, and, and we don't have to be neutral. You have to tell the truth and, and so on. Uh, one of the things that uh, did, um, uh, there's several things, but one of them that really uh, got me recently mm -hmm. was the accident that happened at Showcase. Right. And I felt the silence of the media around that yes. was deafening yeah. because it was almost like protecting a yeah. certain media outlet yes. and the influence it has or something like that. I, I just found that very hard to stomach and I brought it up uh, in places and I recently uh, I, I read one of the ministers mm -hmm. talked about it when the questions have been raised and uh, and uh, the way he sort of just put that aside I thought that was very inhumane because a woman died a woman who would have been 21 in one week's time right. there are two women still sick you know it's a family and I just believe that enough compassion wasn't showed and there was a, uh, a silence from the media that right. shouldn't have been there and I asked the question why mm -hmm. uh, and, and no other investigations and things like that that, need, that people need to know, yeah. that people need to know about. I also find, mm -hmm. I'm watching TV and so on, that people are in the old habit of just reporting what, re, uh, what ministers say, right. long lengthy speeches and so on. When I'm reading, watching, listening, I don't want to hear that. I want a concept concise, you know, I want a point, uh, you know, a concise um, uh, narration of uh, right. what has happened, you know, yeah, so what is happening and so on. So I think there's some kind of a laziness also right. of uh, right. uh, creeping in where people don't want to do the research. Investigative journalism, mm -hmm. I find that missing a lot yes. uh, and, uh, and so on. And uh, it's very easy to find different people to give an opinion, which is good also listening to other people's opinion. Mm -hmm. But what about your own opinion? You know, the opinion pieces and things like yes. that used to come you know I enjoy reading uh, uh, John Kamea right. you know, and, and other people who write those opinion pieces and they've got so much to offer and I think that needs to be encouraged you know so that these are journalists to go and do their research and 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 know about these things mm -hmm. uh, so and I think there are also people I think um, the 
PS for education brought up, the reading, that has been something, you know, that we don't read anymore. No. We don't read anymore. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I bring in all kinds of magazines, you know, like uh, Internet, a new internationalist, we get the newspapers in, and it's sitting there, nobody's reading, reading. all these things, yeah. <laughs> so, and I think the journalists have stopped reading because I, f mm. I feel there's no institutional memory. Yes. And uh, every story, like every day is a new day. Right. And I'll say, but I said that two weeks ago. Right. You know, and they're asking me the same questions, same questions. again. Well, that's me. Yes. You know, I am so much, uh, you know, people ask me for comments and things, but I've said it again. So I just take out an old one and just <laughs> <laughs> tweak it a little bit and bring it to the present one and, and give it out. But I think it, we need a lot more than that. Mm. The, we need a more vibrant media yes. uh, community right now. Mm. Uh, and that's what makes it interesting. Thank you. We'll be back after a short break. So I we'll you wait. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Welcome back to The Lens at 177. Um, we're having such an interesting conversation with the coordinator of the Fiji Women's Crisis Center and human rights activist Shamima Ali. Um, Shamima, you know, there's been a lot of comments by uh, prominent men, uh, ministers, about breastfeeding, the benefits, pros and cons, and uh, even giving birth. And, you know, it seems that men are the loudest voices when it comes to women's issues. And I just wanted to ask for your views on that. You know, I love men's voices, right. particularly if they are talking positively about women's rights and so on. It's really important to do that. And we have got some men who do that. Right. But those who are the most vociferous right. in uh, condemning women who don't, uh, who, uh, uh, do, don't want to breastfeed or around abortions and things like that right. are the men. Right. And I always ask the question, and not in a positive way. I always ask the question, they will never get pregnant. They will never be put in a position to uh, have an abortion. Do they understand why women have abortions? Do they have any understanding why? Uh, when they talk about breastfeeding, are they ever going to breastfeed? Of course not. Biologically, that's impossible. But they are the most vociferous, the lou loudest voices. And, and that irks me. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, recently, of course, the Minister for Health yes. has said that we'll make it a breast-free place, you know, no formulas and so on. Mm -hmm. And we've had this, uh, you know, this same conversation we have had 20 years ago. I remember we again spoke out against that. Right. And there are women who are coming and recently I was speaking to a leader, a woman leader, and she was telling me how women go to her and talk to her about the fact that they are so nervous, they have worked so hard if they are in domestic violence situations. This is what we have seen also. They cannot lactate. Right. They find it hard to lactate. Some women find, find it very, um, very painful right. uh, to, to breastfeed and so on. And they are forced to breastfeed. Mm. And no one is talking, but they're talking to them or, or counseling them. They can't them. even afford the food. Yeah, uh, yeah so nutrition, yeah. yeah. Uh, nutrition, yes. Mm. And they are malnourished, uh, nourished, mm. and so on. And they can't afford the food to be able to breastfeed and so on. Um, and uh, so, you know, so we have to take, you know, as I was saying before, mm. when we say these things, when we, uh, as leaders, when we make decisions and say these things, we must have a deeper thinking around it and right. take other people's opinion. Right. At least one of the things that's lacking, I believe, in, in here, in this country, is the lack of research and data. We say anything, you know, like what we would say, oh, you know, like one, uh, what is the remedy for this pain, you know? Right. So whatever the, you know, the, 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 the tradition is or some myths around that, we say those things just, right. like, just like that. There has to be deeper thinking around that. Mm -hmm. uh, why do women don't want to? How many 
many women are there who want to keep a figure? One of the guys said, uh, because they want to keep their figure and look good and it has good prospects for the job. And that's rubbish. Mm. There might be some women who are figure, figure conscious, right. but most women are not. And when we do that, and I'm glad the health minister said this, that you have to provide the, the, the employers, if women are in paid employment, mm -hmm. we have to provide crashes for women. Right. Free transport, I think, I said free transport to go home and breastfeed and come back. Right. Even pumping takes a long time and women don't have that. With the double, triple burdens that they have, the multitasking they do, yeah. they don't have the time to do all of that. Yeah. So I think we, there has to be a lot of thought and women need to be consulted and we need to get the data, we need to do some research on this and then we can have better solutions to this. And in the same as at the moment we're talking about poverty, the children on the streets yes. and I know the assistant minister for women she is doing her best because she has done this work and the uh, her uh, her uh, you know concern is to get these kids off the street and so on which is a band-aid solution right now we have to we have deeper thinking why are these kids on the street why are they taking drugs why are they doing this? Right. so we need to have all that and we've got three universities now yes. and you know and so there's a lot of potential there to do research and find better solutions mm -hmm. and for women i think uh, you know, whenever we, uh, and, and this is a given for all of us who work in this area of promoting women's rights and right. women's reproductive health and so on, is that it must come from women's experiences. Right, right how they experience violence, how they experience the police, how they experience the courts, the laws, and so on. And then we can have better strategies. In the same way, wh wh why don't women want to breast? What are their experiences? What, are the, what is the work, the care, the unpaid care work, as it's called now, yes. that women do? What is the impact of that on their bodies, on their health, and so on? So all those things we need to talk to the women first. And I call upon all our leaders, you know, yes. that, that in humility, mm -hmm. if you embracing all the people, these are the people who put you where they are. Mm -hmm. So talk to the women first. If you're talking about women, talk to them first right. and get their experiences, get their uh, you know, insights into this. And also talk to the experts, the people who are there as experts. We've got plenty of experts, yes. you know, and good ones too, as well as the uh, bogus ones, uh, uh, the bush ones as we call them, but there are quite a few. So I, I believe that to go for the men, learn about women's needs and so on. Yeah. Women have agency over their rights and, and they must have agencies to do something about it. What men can do, and they're very important, is to be part of the solution, yeah. to learn more about it and then open their mouths. Good, thank you. Um, you know, one issue that has uh, been discussed at length on social media platforms is um, the Honorable Minister for Education. Uh, you know, there was an uh, issue about his uh, previous uh, uh, wife. And, uh, you know, people are saying, why, where was the Fiji Women's Crisis Center? Where were the women's rights movements and all that when that incident happened? And, you know, uh, I just wanted to give you this space just to explain, like, you know, what's your position on that? Or did you do anything at that time? We were there 100%. Mm -hmm. We were there at that point in time. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, and the reason we, and, and because we've done that, we've kept very quiet. Right. You know, and I think the other issue is that when he was appointed right. Minister for Education, mm -hmm. why didn't we speak out yes. about this? Mm -hmm. So one is, and the thing, the, 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 the naysayers, the, what I'm reading in, uh, on social media, mm -hmm. they have very little understanding of women's trauma when they go through this. Right. And uh, to bring this up opens up all the wounds for the survivor, for her children. Right who were very small at that time, mm -hmm. and they have grown up. So we would not, things happened at that point in time, the case was dropped by the DPP's office, right. and we could not do anything anymore. Right. But if right now, mm -hmm. if the survivor chooses to say, I want to go and see the crisis, and I want to open up the case, mm -hmm. we will never say no. We will love to do that. 
you know, for any survivor. We've opened up cases of 10 years ago right. and so on. You know, we've managed to do that. Our li uh, police liaison officer has opened up cases for uh, many years that have covered up and mm -hmm. so on and managed to do that. We would do that, but it's her choice. Again, as I say, the mm -hmm. agency is with her. Right. If she chooses to, we are there to help us, right. uh, to help her out. We do not want to open wounds, uh, you know, old wounds for her, to re-traumatize her. That was a traumatic time for the survivor. Mm -hmm. It always is for survivors, and we don't want to reopen that. If she wishes to and to get help now, mm -hmm. and she comes, we definitely will be helping her. So I think if people would have just picked up the phone, mm -hmm. so this is also the backlash against the feminist movement. Right. You know how when women are doing well, we always want to cut her down, yes. you know, cut them down if they are, if they are uh, sort of... Uh, having uh, uh, having a say yeah. or, and so on. So we always want to cut those kind of people down. Right. And this is exactly what is happening. Mm -hmm. So we just carry on. People are yes. responding and we just carry on and we'll wait. If she wants to, we will take it up. Okay, thank you. I'll now move on to, you know, you had mentioned earlier on in the show that uh, one of your biggest challenges is police. And, uh, you know, for you to do your work and to do it effectively. You have to work with the police. So what has that been like over the years and, and at present? Has there been any change? Um, I do know that uh, there was a comment from a police officer saying, leave us alone, we know what we are doing and things like that right. in one of the newspapers. Uh, but uh, it is all our business. The police are the major stakeholders mm. and uh, they're a government entity and uh, they serve the people. Mm. So the people have a right to hold people accountable as our ministers, as our leaders. Mm. And, and, and the police is no different. Mm. So we've always had, we've worked with the police since we started in 1984, mm. 85. And we worked at the academy, you know, the right. raising awareness, sensitizing them. Because women go there first, they're the major stakeholders. Mm. We are not everywhere. Right. They are everywhere, police uh, in posts, uh, police stations and so on. So the women go there. And, uh, and we find that uh, over the years, we have find, as one commander said at one time, we have a love-hate relationship, you know, so <laughs> we support the police when things go wrong for them they don't have transport you know we'll talk about it and things mm -hmm. like that um, and and you know their living conditions and things we have over the years but we hold them accountable in how they respond to people and particularly in cases of rape child rape domestic violence when women report sexual harassment and so on that is that's an issue that's a problem throughout right. uh, throughout in in at, at all institutions, even in our own communities, right. because we don't take it seriously. It's only happening to women and girls, so we don't worry about it. Yeah. A lot has improved throughout Fiji. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've seen the improvements, governments, and so on. Yeah. But with the police, uh, we had a huge improvement, uh, reporting, responding, the training at the academy. Mm -hmm. We actually helped uh, to, to develop the curriculum on gender violence against oh, women okay. and human rights and so on. Yeah. Um, and they, we had three days there and things like that. So we were working very well. But after 2006, everything stopped. The police became very militarized yes. and we've had military commanders. So the whole force became, it's very different what work police do. And in security times, protect the country, of course, they come together. But they are very different in their everyday job. Right. Hmm. So, but they have been militarized. I also find we we don't we don't not uh, allowed in the we we haven't been asked back to the academy unless the UN is doing all the training and uh, oh. and if they do it and if they call us in then we'll go in for an hour or two. That's not good enough for recruits particularly. We used to do recruits. We used to do the qualifying courses. Even at one stage when uh, the the when uh, Mr. Ngilio was commissioner with UNDP, we did a one week executive level training with oh. the. Uh, deputy commissioner with the commissioner and all the executives and so on. So we were on to a good thing but everything stopped right. um, and so on with different people came in and of course there's a lot of misogynistic people who don't like us. There were also some women mm. who did not like us because uh, you know so, so it's all personalities right. so we stopped going there because we are at the coal front. 
right. the cold face. Yes. We are there. We are the ones who see what is happening and what's not happening, what should happen. Right. And I've got a legal team. Yes. You know, we know the laws inside out yeah. and my counselors are not far behind. Mm. They're all paralegals. Right. So they are they know what is going wrong. So so you know so we and so when we go and teach we tell them look this happened this happened you know like mm. these are the problems we have how do we solve this problem right. so we know whereas when you call in people from outside development partners who don't know you yeah. who haven't worked with you mm. They can't teach you all those right. things, you know, so it's yeah. very much a PowerPoint kind of a learning and yeah. so on. And of course, we all go and sit in fancy hotels and, uh, yeah. you know, and listen and walk for one week and come away again. Yeah. So we're having a lot of difficulties around that. Yeah. We also find uh, that how they respond, how women are turned away. The women who seek us out or come back to us and say we went to report and nothing happened, they are lucky right. because we will then take it up. And the crisis center staff, particularly the counselors, even the lawyers are becoming like that. They are like a dog with a bone. Once they pick up the bone, they don't let it go till they've right. reached the end of it, you know, and right. that's what, as long as the woman wants a survivor once and so on. So we are like that. Right. Uh, so once they come to us, we'll take it right through. Um, so, uh, and then we keep bringing it up. There's a no drop policy, how to obtain a DVRO, there are new laws, and so right. we find there's also a lack of knowledge around the laws. Right. The rape laws mm -hmm. that you don't have to take somebody to a woman who reports rape or a girl who reports you don't immediately have to wait for the medical medical right. examination mm -hmm. and so on and so laws have changed mm -hmm. but they haven't changed so we find a lack of knowledge around that mm -hmm. in many many of the police stations and the people who are responding particularly the new people who have joined the police right. force we also finding within over the years these last few years uh, the the the, the cover-up when police officers commit, oh, right. allegedly commit crimes, yes. and particularly sexual harassment um, and other kinds of harassment of women and so on. And there has, you know, the, the cover up is very strong, the brotherhood yes. comes into effect. And, uh, and uh, many women have suffered. Uh, right. We have been dealing with it with various commissioners and so on. Uh, hopefully now uh, that uh, we have managed to uncover a few things yes. and we are working with, uh, with, uh, with the survivors and uh, you know, and, and things are in process. That things will change, mm -hmm. um, and uh, but it is difficult. The police really needs to, I believe, take a good look within itself, right. and just become the police force that we know that that is for the people, and they were in the process of being quite progressive and I think we need to take them back there. I, I believe that they are also victims, yes. but misogyny in the police force, that needs to go because it already is a male bastion of power, that institution, right. just like the military is. Mm. So, you know, so these are, you know, the, the male dominated uh, institutions and there we need to really create a level playing field and there needs to be a lot of sensitization. Um, uh, work-wise in employment as well as in responding to people. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back after a short break for our final segment with the coordinator of the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre, Shamima Ali. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Welcome back to The Lens at 177. Um, we're with the coordinator of the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre and a human rights activist, uh, Shamima Ali. Um, you know, we spoke at length about so many issues during the show and just uh, lastly, I wanted to ask you, you know, what, what does the uh, future hold? Uh, not only for the organisation, but also for the country. 
Well, our future with the crisis center is our motto has always been working ourselves out of business. So, you know, our dream is that one day we will have a Fiji where everyone, men, women, in all their diversities, they enjoy their full human rights yes. and so on. So, you know, so we're working towards that. Now, <coughs> as far as the country is concerned, you know, I really want to see a country that is multiracial, multicultural, because yeah. that is the beauty of Fiji. Yes. There's so many opportunities, you know, and we must not lose these opportunities mm -hmm. to make us shine. And we should get rid of self-serving politicians right. who are all for themselves. Mm -hmm. Everything is about them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and what they want and so on. Uh, I, I believe that we need to have another look at leadership. Yes. What kind of uh, politicians do we want? What kind of leaders do we want? Right. <coughs> and uh, you know there has to be humility, there has to be, they have to be all embracing. Right. Uh, we are no longer like uh, oh, just because a certain sector didn't vote for us, we don't do anything for them. You know right. once you are voted in you are for everybody, you know, right. you are for all of the people of Fiji, all the citizens and so on. Um, so, you know, so I would really like to see that. I would like to see a movement where people start defining this leadership, yeah. that we must never, and we must pledge that we never go back to the last 16 years. Yes. You know, we must never have that experience again. Mm -hmm. Our people, our young people, our children deserve a lot better. We all deserve a lot better. Mm -hmm. So I just, I'm hoping that there is a movement towards the kind of leadership we want, more conversations around that. Mm -hmm. um, I also believe that our constitution needs to be looked at. Right. Um, there are mm -hmm. some good parts in there, uh, particularly those that were plagiarized from Yashkai, right. Yashkai's constitution. Yes. So those are the good parts, but a lot of the good parts were put away. Yes. I know and I think we need to, I know that it, for, uh, it, it prohibits us from, uh, you know, changing it for a number of years and things like that, but we need to right. start uh, looking at it mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, there have been some good articles by Mr. Nakarawa mm -hmm. uh, about uh, constitutionality mm -hmm. and constitutions and so on. So we, and, and there we, are, we have a lot of people who are writing about things, you know, yes. what then is writing about racism. We need to look it full in the face and see how do we move forward. I really want racism to go away uh, oh. from this country because that has been the downfall of all of us. Right. Fiji is good enough and big enough for everybody who is here, who has taken Fiji as its home, who have, ex uh, who have um, taken to heart Fiji as their home. Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, and it might seem very simple, but there's a lot of work in there and we all need to work together, all of us together. And I like the way the parliament is right now. There's yeah. a lot more camaraderie you know, between the two sides yes. of the house. Yes. I never used to watch Parliament TV before, mm -hmm. but I watch it now because this is what I was used to, even though we didn't have TV, mm -hmm. but we used to read in the papers yes. and so on, how people used to talk to each other, the camaraderie, they fought mm -hmm. like nobody's business. They debated things sensibly, right. but there was that camaraderie. So I'm liking that and I'm hoping that we're onto a good thing yeah. uh, uh, in this, um, you know. So, yeah, so, you know, just, I think a lot of people, I'm echoing the sentiment of a lot of people who are not who are not as privileged as I am to be able to have this <laughs> voice you know with 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 the media or being able to be on social media and say things and have our own uh, social pages and things so uh, I, I just think that that's where we should be going and this is a huge opportunity and I say to our leaders you know from the prime ministers to the opposition to all the ministers let's work together and make this work all the political parties but I also would like to see a political movement that is very progressive right. and that is uh, all uh, all embracing of all the people in this country yeah. uh, you know it, it's good you mentioned um, leadership and uh, the parliament as we see it right now but there also appears to be a bit of uh, uh, maybe volatility you know with a three-party coalition um, you know that's uh, causing some people to raise concerns on social media about it. So, you know, you had mentioned before that, uh, you know, we need to put the country first. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it was a very powerful message. So could you just speak a little bit about that as well? Yes. Um, 
So, uh, you know, uh, yes, as I said, coalitions are difficult yes. wherever you are. Right. And you have to please each other. Mm -hmm. And the person, and, and, and the part that holds the balance of power, right. you have to keep pleasing them. Right. Uh, and I, I think we need to get away from that situation. Right. Uh, the party needs to understand that. Mm -hmm. And as I said, Fiji first. That is <laughs> Put Fiji first. <laughs> Put Fiji first. <laughs> Put, Fiji. Put Fiji first, you know, like... Uh, mm -hmm. Um, not in the way that, uh, you know, that it, it, it was not what we did the last 16 years. Mm -hmm. But our country, uh, this land must come first. The, mm -hmm. the, 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 the be everything that we do must be to the benefit of this country, mm -hmm. uh, to the people of this country, and particularly the, the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a situation of poverty and things like that. Mm -hmm. Let's look at that, not, you know, filling our own pockets, not seeing how many trips we can go on and how much allowances we can collect and things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's another thing thing I'd like to uh, for it to you know the less trips the work is here let's get out on our hands and knees and do the work and there will be many people who will be helping these ministers mm -hmm. so yeah so I think that's what I'm talking about and we need to all calm down uh, we do know that there are uh, you know that each political party has got uh, each uh, uh, section of the government has got its own political party to answer to yeah. so I also call upon the political parties mm -hmm that you know be calm mm. and think of our country think of fiji right. put the country before your you know before our own selves and our own self gains and and our people are these people you must do this for our people and so on. do it for everybody right. and particularly the vulnerable thank you i think that's a wonderful message from uh, and a very powerful message from the coordinator of the fiji women's crisis center and human rights activist shamima ali We'd like to thank her for joining us on the show and yes, we'd sir. like to see you back at some point uh, in time, you know, uh, to speak about how things progress or are progressing. And um, for yes. those of you out there, please do visit our website, www.fijitimes.com and our social media pages to watch this show and uh, hear firsthand the views from the lady herself, the Iron Lady, Shamima Ali. You know.